Hi, I'm Jeff Watts and welcome to another of my top 10 tips videos. This video is all about the subject of conflict management. Yes, welcome back. And I've had a few people ask me about conflict, um, not least because in one of my previous videos, I talked about a retrospective tip being to encourage healthy conflict. And Igor Kachanov specifically asked me to do a video about this. So here we go, Igor, this one's for you. Hello. Conflict is a big topic. It's a big, uh, touchy subject. A lot of people are scared of conflict and uh, will sort of put themselves down, label themselves as somebody who avoids conflict. Um, it's uncomfortable, but it's inevitable. And actually, in many, many cases, it's a source of team growth. If you can get through conflict and be able to learn to manage it in a healthy way, then you can use conflict to get better decisions, to get stronger teamwork, greater sense of trust, risk management. There are all sorts of benefits to being able to for a team to be able to actually challenge itself and challenge each other uh, rather than just go along and, and keep everything nice and calm and smooth. So there are a number of things that you can do that will help a team get through conflict in a healthier way. So here they are, 10 to 1. Well, at 10, now, in many ways this could well be my number one tip, but it's so fundamental that without it, the rest of the tips that I'm gonna go through are kind of irrelevant. So I'm putting it at 10 because it's one of the first things you need to do. And that is to seek permission to be the conflict facilitator. Uh, if you're gonna get people to open up, to open up their minds to new possibilities, to resolve differences and, and feel safe enough to air their concerns, then you having permission to, to facilitate that discussion and the resolution is paramount. And part of that, being an effective facilitator, is being respected by all parties and perceived to be neutral and fair and impartial. Now, I do know some people that will actually deliberately facilitate a, a tricky situation badly in order to effectively create a common enemy for all the conflicting parties. So if everybody dislikes your facilitation, then they've got something in common and they're starting to bond. I can see the logic in that. Uh, and there's some truth to it, but it's a relatively risky strategy. Uh, and one that I wouldn't recommend unless you were, say, desperate. So first of all, just get permission that these people would like to see the conflict resolved and that they will accept you as a party to help them resolve that. Tip nine is to agree some ground rules. Now, it doesn't really matter what those ground rules are as long as everyone involved is happy with them. So facilitating the discussion about what kind of ground rules we want for this discussion, whether it's the type of language that we will and won't find acceptable, whether it's a certain amount of time that people will have to speak without being interrupted, whether there's a, you know, a kind of format, an agenda to this, what, you know, whatever it is, agree some ground rules so that people are all comfortable and they know how this is going to play out and, and where the lines are, where the boundaries are. Perhaps some training in nonviolent communication, for example, could be a good way to start off a, a more respectful dialogue. And if you're interested, I can do another video specifically on nonviolent communication, if you like. Let me know in the comments. Tip eight, tone and pace. Now, a lot of people will underestimate and find it hard to believe how influential your tone and pace can be for other people. So the quicker you talk, the quicker other people will talk. The more stressed you seem, the more stressed they will become. But equally, the slower and calmer you talk, the slower and calmer everybody else will talk. It's kind of a human instinct to fit in and be like everybody else, to not stand out. And 
it's not a it's not a malevolent manipulation. It's simply a tactic to keep everything calm. Uh, because when everybody's calm, we're more likely to achieve a resolution. Tip seven, acknowledge perspectives. Being able to acknowledge somebody else's perspective, even if you don't agree with it, is a huge sign of respect. And nobody's going to agree to any kind of reconciliation or, or compromise or any agreement, really, if they don't feel that their perspective has been acknowledged. So it's critical that everybody has the opportunity to put their perspective forward. Whether we and the other parties agree with that perspective is not necessarily the point here. The point is that everybody has their perspective. There's always more than one view and how a situation can be interpreted. We're going to get those out there. We're going to acknowledge them and then we can move forward. Now my next two tips are actually techniques. They're, they're actually things that you could do, exercises that you could run with a, with a team or with, with, a, with a couple of aggrieved parties. So use them if you think they will be useful, but be careful with them. Tip six is a technique called the high school debate. Um, not a particularly mysterious title. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, generally getting the group into two, two teams uh, where they will argue either for or against a particular statement. So, for example, the statement could be, this team believes that test-driven development would be a good thing to do. One team would then have to argue in favour of that statement, and one, one team would have to argue against that statement. Uh, regardless of their personal opinions, they would have to debate for their side. Then, depending again on how, how well you think this team will cope with it, they could, you could involve a round of cross-examination uh, just to explore the, the depths of it. Tip five. Now, this is only really going to be useful if the level of trust is quite high. Uh, is, is a technique called ritual descent. And it was devised by Dave Snowden of Cognitive Edge. And I'm going to put a link underneath here so you can actually read a little bit more about it in depth in your own time. But the general gist of it is somebody puts a proposal forward, somebody puts an argument forward uh, and goes to another group where that group will listen without interrupting, without questioning. And then the person who went to that group will then turn around so they have their back to the people who are going to discuss the idea, the suggestion, the proposal, and they will rip that idea to shreds. They will come up with all the reasons why it's the worst idea in the world, it'll never work, while the person whose suggestion it was sits there and makes notes if they, if they want to, and they'll go back to their group and, uh, and feedback what they heard. Uh, they can then choose to incorporate some, all or none of that feedback and iterate on their idea uh, and go back perhaps to another group if we've got more than two groups involved. It's a way of providing feedback in a structure that is deliberately negative so that we depersonalize it uh, and it's almost funny. Uh, it's a game almost to be as, as, as unhelpful and as unproductive and as critical as possible uh, which, which makes it, uh, gives it a different dynamic. But like I said, requires a lot of trust, requires a lot of safety in the team. Tip four is to remember that you are a part of this. Now you as a neutral facilitator, you might think you're outside of this debate, you don't really have strong opinions either way, you're neutral, you're impartial, but you're still affected by this. Anybody in a situation of conflict is going to have, it's going to have an impact on them. So make sure that your needs are being taken account of, that you're looking after yourself. As they say on, on the aeroplane, fit your oxygen mask before fitting other people's. You're not going to be of any use as a facilitator if this situation is affecting you too much. So take care of yourself. Tip three is to create a mutual goal. So if we've got two parties that are disagreeing about something, they've got conflict about something, is there something, perhaps at a higher level, that they can agree on? Now it might be that we would like, ideally, to create a situation where we are a harmonious team that, um, and we would all like to be part of that harmonious team. If we can agree on that, 
we've got a mutual goal to aim for. And that this disagreement, this conflict, is just one obstacle that's in our way of getting there. We can agree that we're aiming for that, and we're a team working towards that to get past this obstacle in the way. Tip two is look to the future as much as possible. Now, I'm not saying what's happened in the past is irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. That's a source of a lot of, uh, of angst, anxiety, frustration, anger, perhaps. And, and, and looking at that and resolving it is, is a good thing if we can. However, it's gone. Okay, we can't do anything about it now. What we can affect, really, is the future. So if we can, as much as possible as facilitator, bring people back to looking forward rather than continuously looking back, uh, looking to the future rather than continuously going back to the past, that's going to increase the chances of a positive and healthy um, result. And tip one is to make agreements, as many agreements as you can, Whenever there is any hint of something that the, the, the conflicting parties do agree on, capture it. Write it on a post-it note, write it on the whiteboard, whatever. Capture these are the things that, and create a list of all the things that we do have agreement on. Because at the moment, those parties are focused only on what they disagree on. All right? And that's how they're defining their relationship. But if we can switch that perception of the relationship, we can start creating and capturing lots of data points that re-emphasize what we, what we do agree on and actually make visible how much we do agree on, then we're, we're starting to change the perception of the dynamic of our relationship into we agree on a lot, but we disagree on one thing. Now, can we use the fact that we do agree on a lot and we do have a lot in common to help us get past this one part of disagreement? So, a quick recap. Seek permission to resolve the conflict. Agree some ground rules. Monitor your tone and pace. Acknowledge perspectives. Perhaps try a high school debate or ritual dissent. Remember to take care of you. Create a mutual goal. Look to the future as much as possible and make agreements wherever you can. Now, if we take the two techniques that I gave you out of the tips, then we can pull together a helpful acronym. Stay calm. If you can stay calm, and everybody can stay calm in a conflict, we're much more likely to resolve it in a helpful and healthy way. So, even though we might not be able to get to a point where a team can, can look forward to or embrace conflict, that might be a little bit weird. At least we can, if we can stay calm and follow some of these tips and these principles, we might get to a point where teams can actually use conflict to get better and grow and develop. And that's got to be a good thing. If you've got any other tips for encouraging healthy conflict or helping to resolve conflict in a healthy and helpful and constructive way, I'd love to hear them in the comments. And if you please, it's the same old thing, like and subscribe. Uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel, that would be fantastic. Um, and if you've got anything that you would like some tips on in the future, again, add it to the comments and you never know, the next video could be looking at a problem with yours. Until then, take care and I'll see you soon.